Is it just me or is this weird? Um, I've been sat in the microscope making histology videos for almost a year. I've kind of forgotten how to do this. Um, cavo caval anastomoses. What does that mean? Why do we care about it? Why is this anatomy important clinically? Um, that's what we'll look at. We'll describe it very nicely and neatly. I've got quite a bit on these torso models that I can show you. Uh, and guess who's running anatomy spotter exams tomorrow? Right. <laughs> Okay, let's open you up. Cavo, caval anastomosis. What could that refer to? Well, cavo, caval, superior vena cava, and the inferior vena cava being surrounded by the liver here. Um, so, an anastomosis. Well, if we think about an anastomosis in terms of blood vessels, um, an artery takes blood to a tissue. The blood goes through a capillary bed and comes out through a vein, essentially. Right. If you had a connection between two blood vessels that didn't go through a capillary bed, those two blood vessels are connected, that would be an anastomosis. You could have an anastomosis between an artery and an artery. Um, we see lots of that around joints. You can have an anastomosis between a vein and a vein. Um, veins do that a lot anyway because they're quite a bit more varied than arteries. And you could have an arteriovenous anastomosis in that an artery sends blood straight into a vein. Sounds weird, uh, erectile tissues. So here we have the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava then is taking blood from the abdomen, from the pelvis, from the lower limbs. And that blood is being taken up into the heart, into the right atrium. The superior vena cava is also taking blood into the right atrium, but it's taking blood from the chest from the upper limbs and from the head and neck. So serving two different regions of the body. Now, what would happen if the inferior vena cava um, became narrowed or it was harder to pass blood through it for some reason? And how might that even happen? Uh, well, pregnancy, as the fetus grows, um, it's actually quite easy to compress veins. Arteries are high pressure, veins are low pressure. You, know, you can do that in the veins close to the skin, you can see how easy it is to compress them. Um, so during pregnancy, when you're lying on your back, uh, the inferior vena cava might become compressed. Tumors in this region might push into the inferior vena cava. There's no spare space in the body in most places. Um, fibrosis, this is a retroperitoneal structure. Fibrosis after surgery can change the tissues here. Things can stick together and that can change um, the shape of the inferior vena cava, deep vein thrombosis. Um, so clots might collect in here. In fact, you, surgically, you can put a filter into the inferior vena cava that prevents those clots from getting to the lungs and causing a pulmonary embolism. If there are problems with that filter, that might reduce flow through the inferior vena cava. Uh, trauma might uh, affect flow through the inferior vena cava. And actually, there are, there are, norm, there are congenital differences where the inferior vena cava might just have grown that way. It might just be narrower. I've read cases um, where, and this will link to what we're going to talk about in a moment, I've read about cases where people have had a <coughs> congenital narrowing of the inferior vena cava, and it hasn't given signs or symptoms until later in life when everything else has grown. And in fact, many people might have a completely asymptomatic narrowed inferior vena cava because of the collateral flow, because of the connections, because of the anastomoses that exist that allow blood from the abdomen, pelvis and lower limbs to instead pass sort of up the inferior vena cava, but to take other routes to get back to the heart. There are two main ones and a couple of smaller ones. Let's take each one in turn. Okay, uh, number one and the most important one. I want to get to the posterior thoracic wall, so I'm going to swap for a different model. So here we can see there's the inferior vena cava. That's where the heart would sit, right? Um, so this is the abdomen, this is the thorax. And up in the thorax, we can see uh, the azygos system of veins. So in the posterior thoracic wall, we have intercostal veins running between the ribs, carrying the blood of the thoracic wall back to the azygos veins and the hemiazygos veins. The hemiazygos veins will take their blood to the right side. And the azygos vein is actually just this little, arch, little, little vein here, which is actually going to ascend and loop over and 
drain blood into the superior vena cava at that point. So that's how blood from the posterior thoracic wall drains to the superior vena cava and to the heart. Now inferiorly, in the abdomen, there's our inferior vena cava. Um, oh yeah, look, it's right up against the aorta, so an, an aortic aneurysm can also compress the inferior vena cava. Anyway, sorry. So inferior vena cava in the abdomen does something similar to the intercostal veins in the chest. We see, look, we see these branches here. So these are the lumbar vertebrae. So these are lumbar veins, and those lumbar veins are draining blood from the abdominal walls into the inferior vena cava there, right? Um, that blood passes into the inferior vena cava and up to the heart. Uh, the trick here is that there are ascending lumbar veins under here, which we can't see. So the ascending lumbar veins are just a little bit they're just a little bit further around there. The ascending lumbar veins link these lumbar veins and they continue as the azygos and hemiazygos veins because segmented pattern, right? That means that if the inferior vena cava was compressed and you couldn't send blood through it or all the blood fluid through it, all this blood from the abdomen, pelvis and lower limbs could instead then go in the opposite direction into the lumbar veins up the ascending lumbar veins, into the azygos system, back to the superior vena cava, and back to the heart. So that's the first anastomosis, and that's the primary clinical one. And this is why um, narrowing of the inferior vena cava might actually be asymptomatic, because th this is one of four, but this is a pretty good um, collateral route of circulation. So that's a cavo, caval anastomosis. That's number one. Number two, uh, we need to go to the back, go back to the other model. In the back, we have a, um, a column of vertebrae. And all these structures drain blood as well. And look, we can see some of that here. Um, there is an internal vertebral venous plexus draining blood from the spinal cord and no doubt collecting blood from the bones as well. And there's an external vertebral venous plexus outside the bones, likewise collecting blood from the vertebral column, and those two vertebral plexuses link together. This is what I mean about veins having lots of connections anyway, right? We often see these plexuses of veins rather than individual veins. So um, these internal vertebral venous plexus and external vertebral venous plexus run the length of the vertebral column which runs the length you know thor links the thorax and the abdomen and the pelvis right and these veins the lumbar veins link to those vertebral venous plexuses and the intercostal veins and the zygos veins also link to those vertebral venous plexuses right which means that if the inferior vena cava was compressed for any reason and it was difficult to pass blood through it, blood could instead take the easier option of passing through the lumbar veins into the external and internal vertebral venous plexuses and ascend to the thorax where they would drain into the intercostal veins which would drain into the azygos vein which would again drain into the superior vena cava and to the right chamber of the heart. So that is number two. Uh, that is the... Um, the second uh, cavo-caval anastomosis, the vertebral venous plexuses. And you might be thinking Batson's veins, if that's jumped into your head. So we often talk about this, the, these vertebral venous plexuses as a potential route for metastatic disease to pass from the pelvis to other regions, regions of the body. And this is often why metastatic cells end up in vertebrae. Uh, Batson described this um, and described veins linking these parts of the body to the vertebral venous plexuses and that they are valveless, which means you can change the direction of flow. And because veins are a low pressure part of the system, that's quite easy to do. Coughing, sneezing, defecating, lifting something heavy. <laughs> that will push blood out of, the, um, out of the torso and in the opposite direction back through these veins and back to the vertebral venous plexuses again. So Batson's veins, but in terms of cavo caval anastomoses, the vertebral venous plexuses, internal and external, link the inferior vena cava and the external, uh, the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava. Number three, um, number three, I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to put
pull them all together. Um, going to need to rebuild you a little bit, maybe. So, oh, well, down here, we've got um, the external iliac veins, uh, which, are, which were the femoral veins. So the external iliac veins are draining blood from the lower limbs, the internal iliac veins. Draining blood from the pelvis, common iliac veins, they come together form the inferior vena cava. Well, down here, um, actually, no, I can just put the front on, can't I? Um, there we go, that's a good cheat, isn't it? Body wall. So, um, gaster. We think about gaster as stomach, gra gastric, right? Gaster is the belly. Um, epigastric veins are upon the belly. So there are epigastric veins draining the abdominal wall here. We've got a superficial epigastric vein and an inferior epigastric vein. Um, so they're draining to those, um, the, those iliac branches, right? So they're draining blood from the abdominal wall to essentially the inferior vena cava, which is gonna take that blood back up to the heart. Now up here in the chest, we have um, an internal mammary vein deep to the bones here, or um, internal thoracic vein. So that's draining the blood of the thoracic wall. Laterally out here, we have a lateral thoracic vein or an external mammary vein. Same structure, two different names, right? Um, and that, that's under here, and that's draining blood from the thoracic wall as well. That's draining blood back to the axillary vein, whereas the internal thoracic vein is draining blood to the subclavian vein. Essentially the same vessel, we we'll just changed its name, right? You know that. Um, and there are anastomoses between these blood vessels, these veins in the torso, in the body wall. You might hear about thoraco epigastric veins, thoracoepigastric veins. So they're linking those veins. And, um, oh yeah, a superior epigastric vein. So if we've got an inferior epigastric vein, you've got to have a superior epigastric vein. So that's draining blood back to the um, internal thoracic vein. So there's two different routes there, right? Um, but essentially, epigastric veins and um, thoracic veins have connections in the body wall and this is another route by which blood if it can't pass through the inferior vena cava will instead pass in the opposite direction to normal through these veins through the veins of the body wall uh, and then into the subclavian vein axillary axillary vein um, brachiocephalic vein superior vena cava and um, back to the heart so that's 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 three and four really um, but I guess the key idea there is that, and we'll talk about more about this in a moment, if that happens, more blood will pass through the veins. Veins don't have a nice thick muscular wall like arteries do, they have a thin muscular wall. Um, so when you ask them to take more blood, more pressure, more load, they will dilate and that's, you know, that's why we see varicose veins in the lower limb and that sort of thing. So you might see dilated veins under the skin uh, of your patient if blood can't pass through the inferior vena cava and is instead taking alternate routes. That's why I kind of lump these together as in the veins of the abdomen, the veins of the thorax body wall are connected. That's a collateral route. That's a cavo cavo anastomosis if you see that sign. And that's different to caput medusae um, and portosystemic anastomoses. Ooh. So then, is that why this is useful anatomy to be aware of? Um, yeah, so veins will dilate if they're taking more blood than usual. There is not, you, in most places of the body, there is not spare space. Um, if these are veins are on the surface, they've got space to expand into, but if the veins of the internal and external vertebral venous plexuses dilate, there are some really important and really sensitive structures in there. So yes, this can lead to neurological symptoms. Um, and this was a case I read about um, as a young woman got older, so moved past adolescence and, you know, her body became bigger and more blood was being passed around. She started to develop, I think, signs of cordura equina and... Um, 
kind of signs of sciatica, I think, you know, uh, neurological symptoms of the lower limb and the pelvis and the perineum because um, her inferior vena cava was narrowed. So blood for her whole life had been taking these other collateral routes and these veins were now starting to dilate and compress the structures of the cauda equina, compress the uh, spinal nerves as they're leaving this space and give those, those neurological signs and symptoms. Um, also, um, those, um, those, these veins here are retroperitoneal. So if these veins enlarge, I don't know how, uh, you know, there's a chance of them rupturing and having retroperitoneal bleeding, but I don't know how common that is. But certainly, if you're looking at someone's radiological imaging, the CT, MR, that sort of thing, you should be aware that these veins exist and that they might be dilated as a result of this process. You know what you're looking at, right? Um, so, yeah, functionally, this can be really important anatomy. You kind of need to be aware that this exists. Cavo, caval anastomoses, collateral routes of circulation between the inferior ca vena cava and the superior vena cava. It's the inferior vena cava that's most often restricted by pressures in here pushing on it by a number of the any of the structures nearby or by a congenital difference in which it's narrowed, so blood will take these alternate routes. Through the ascending lumbar veins, to the zygos system, through the vertebral venous plexuses, or through the epigastric and thoracic veins in the uh, in the in the body wall. So that's what you're looking out for. Um, I don't know. For me, it's just one of those because I'm not a clinical anatomist, right? I just want to know how everything works. For me, that's just fascinating that that's laid out and it matches the body pattern we see laid out during embryology anyway i hope that was useful and uh, i mentioned portosystemic anastomoses so portosystemic anastomoses describe um, when it's difficult for blood to pass from the gastrointestinal tract through the liver because of usually some liver disease um, the liver has tiny microscopic channels in it the blood passes through so if the liver becomes um, more fibrous, it's harder to pass the blood through the liver. So that blood from the GI tract, from the hepatic portal vein, will find alternate routes to get back to the heart. And uh, those portosystemic anastomoses are different. I've done a video on that, probably a couple of videos, maybe. Go and have a look at those and you can, you'll can you see the differences for yourself. Um, excuse the uh, cuts on my hands. Guess he was climbing a sport route on the weekend and found that it ended with a jamming, a very sharp jamming crack. Anyway, right, uh, see you next week.